Assalamualaikum and hi there. Welcome to part 2 of the lecture Acute Inflammation. I am Dr. Mardiana Abdulaziz from the Department of Pathology, UITM. For this part of the lecture, the learning objectives are as follows. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to briefly describe the chemical mediators in inflammation, to explain the pathophysiology of clinical manifestations, the effects of acute inflammation, including the cardinal signs, to describe the morphological features, both microscopic and microscopic, of acute inflammation. And skill-wise, you should be able to identify the macroscopic and microscopic features of acute inflammation. What are the mediators of inflammation? Mediators are substances that initiate and regulate inflammatory reactions. They can either be cell-derived or plasma-derived. Cell-derived mediators are produced by cells such as macrophages, neutrophils, and platelets. And they are either pre-synthesized, so they're synthesized in advance and stored in intracellular granules, or they can be synthesized de novo upon stimulus. Plasma-derived mediators, on the other hand, are produced by the liver and are present in circulation as inactive precursors. They are activated upon the presence of stimulus. Examples of cell-derived mediators include histamine, uh, which are pre-synthesized and stored in mast cells, and prostaglandins, which are synthesized de novo. An example of plasma-derived mediators are complement proteins. There are some basic properties of inflammatory mediators which make them um, helpful in terms of promoting as well as regulating inflammatory reaction. The first one is that active mediators are only produced in response to stimuli. They are also short-lived, uh, which means that they are degraded quite quickly after they are activated. Different mediators may share the same function, and at the same time, a single mediator can have many functions. And one mediator can stimulate the release of other secondary mediators. Therefore, their functions are quite diverse. Some examples of common mediators uh, and their actions include histamine, which are involved in the process of vasodilation, increase in vascular permeability, prostaglandins in vasodilation, mediating pain and fever, which is a systemic effect of inflammation. Uh, there are also leukotrienes, there are cytokines, there are complements and kinins. And what you can see is that some of these mediators, there are different mediators, but some of them have the same action, such as vasodilation, increased vascular permeability. And for example, both um, cytokines as well as prostaglandins, they have effect in the systemic uh, manifestations of inflammation. So now let's revisit our cardinal signs uh, of inflammation. And the reason why they're here is because the cardinal signs of inflammation is not only part of the clinical manifestation uh, of inflammation, but they are also part of the morphology of inflammation that you can see. So the first one is heat. Heat occurs because of vasodilation and increased blood flow to the area. In terms of redness, this occurs similarly because of vasodilation and increase in blood flow to the area. And on top of that, if you recall, when you have loss of fluid, there will be subsequent stasis in the blood flow and that also contributes to redness. The increase in vascular permeability and the subsequent fluid exudation um, out of the vessels into the extravascular space will lead to swelling or edema. And pain occurs because of action of chemical mediators which induce pain, such as kinins, which we saw in the last slide. And also, it can be due to the stretching and distortion of tissue, um, which again can be a result of local swelling. Severe injury or local swelling can also lead to loss of function. And on top of that, if there is pain, the presence of pain itself can also inhibit the use of the tissue and the organ involved in that process of inflammation. 
The gross morphology of acute inflammation is a manifestation of the cardinal features of inflammation, such as edema and swelling, which manifests as organ enlargement, and also redness and erythema. Or sometimes the gross morphology may take form of one of the morphological patterns or variations of inflammation. In terms of microscopic morphology, again, they are manifestations of the events that occur in the process of acute inflammation. For example, the increase in blood flow, the congestion can be seen here with engorgement of the vessels with red blood cells. On top of that, when there is increase in vascular permeability, you will have edema fluid collecting there. So here, these manifest as these white spaces in between the cells. So this is all fluid. And the fluid, as you know, can be in the form of exudate fibrinous or suppurative. So here is fibrin, a cellular pinkish material, and also neutrophilic uh, or leukocyte debris. The main cell involved in the process of acute inflammation uh, is neutrophil, so are neutrophils rather, so neutrophilic infiltrate is also typically seen in the process of acute inflammation, as you can see here. Okay, so here are some examples of um, morphological changes that can be seen in acute inflammation. The first one is acute appendicitis, top right, normal appendix, slim and long and thin and glistening and white but in the process of inflammation this all changes you can see the cirrhosis is markedly red there is congestion and on top of that you can see this yellowish uh, material depositing on the surface of the cirrhosis and this is fibrinous exudate Okay. On top of that, the appendix is also often become enlarged or swollen. So you can see the diameter of the appendix is slightly larger than what you would see typically. And this here, when you have opened the appendix, this is the lumen. So the mucosa and the lumen, the mucosa is covered by suppurative material. And again, you have fibrin coating on the outer surface of the appendix. So this is all fibrin. In addition to that, you can see that the wall of the appendix is also quite congested, as you can see here. Microscopically, the changes include neutrophilic uh, infiltrate. So these are all neutrophils, the one with multilobated nuclei, and they are infiltrating the lamina propria as well as within the crypt lumina here. And on the left side, this is actually an example of mucosal ulceration. So this is the epithelium and the epithelium uh, of the mucosa is lost. So that is the definition of an ulceration. And this is replaced by superative exudate as you can see here. Here's another example as we saw earlier. Conjunctivitis, very red eye, erythema or redness. And here's an example of uh, mosquito bites. Again, redness. Okay, and a bit of swelling as well. And this is an example of a cellulitis, so inflammation of the soft tissue of the skin. So nice comparison here. This is normal and the leg which is involved by inflammation is very, very red. You can see that it is larger. So it's um, also swollen and edematous. And if you can actually feel or examine this leg, you will feel that it is also warm, um, therefore there is an element of heat there as well. So those are the basic uh, morphological changes that you can see, but there is also several morph morphological patterns of acute inflammation that can be seen. The first one is serous inflammation. So serous inflammation refers to a prominent exudation of fluid, but this fluid is cell poor. So it's predominantly fluid, not a lot of leukocytes, not a lot of cell debris, and they collect in extravascular space. And they are due to increased vascular permeability or sometimes secretions by mesothelial cells. And here is an example of one occurring in the epidermis. So they form like a local blister. The, they're also prone to occur in peritoneal lined body cavities such as pleura and pericardium. If the fluid um, drains and there is not a lot of damage occurring, then typically this uh, will have a complete resolution. The second pattern, morphological pattern of inflammation is fibrinous inflammation. 
um, as opposed to the serous inflammation, the fluid that exudates out in fibrinous inflammation is rich in fibrin. And this is due to, again, an increase in vascular permeability or if there is presence of a local procoagulant stimulus such as cancer cells. And this happens in the lining of body cavities such as the meninges, pleura, pericardium. So this is a typical example of pericardial um, fibrinous inflammation. So you can see this kind of yellowish, uh, stringy exudate material deposited on the surface of the heart. If the fibrin is completely cleared, rapidly cleared and completely cleared, then you can have resolution. But if there is too much fibrin, then there will be lots of granulation tissue coming in, then healing will be in the form of fibrosis. So you can see fibrin takes the form of acellular pinkish material. Purulent or suppurative inflammation is also known as abscess. Okay, so this is an example of an abscess in the skin. Um, this is one in the liver, so it contains this yellowish kind of milky material because there is a lot of leukocyte debris necrotic material within it. This is an example of multiple small abscesses in the lung and microscopically you see aggregates and collections of neutrophils, leukocytes, dead leukocytes, necrotic tissue and cells. They're all combined in the middle forming pus or abscess. Again, it is due to increase in vascular permeability and also favoured to form if the infection is by pyogenic bacteria. Because there is um, associated uh, damage to the architecture, so complete resolution is not the usual outcome in this setting. So either the abscess will persist to become a chronic inflammatory process or when they heal, they will heal by fibrosis. Okay, and lastly, the morphological pattern that can be seen in inflammation is ulcer. Ulcer means local defect or full thickness loss of epidermis or mucosa. So it can happen in the skin, such as this one. You can see there is a gap on the skin. And here is in the um, um, inside of your mouth, so the oral mucosa. There is again a gap here, and this is in the stomach. So there is again a hole or a gap here in the mucosa. It occurs because there is tissue necrosis or inflammation which happens on or near a surface. And here's microscopically, this is what you can see. So this is um, from the gastrointestinal tract. You have the mucosa and here you have the mucosa and then here you have a big gap or a hole where the mucosa is completely lost. So this is what an ulcer is. And again, because the architecture is damaged, then resolution, um, usually it's quite to achieve unless um, the ulcer is very small and rapidly heals. Um, if it's a large ulcer or persistent ulcer, then the typical outcome is fibrosis. So to quickly recap what we have covered in part two of this lecture, we talked about the mediators, um, where they come from, and also their characteristics. We talked about the cardinal signs of inflammation, the five cardinal signs, what they are and what the pathophysiology underlying them. And we also covered the morphology, both macroscopic and microscopic uh, morphological features of acute inflammation. Uh, where the macroscopic and microscopic features are both manifestation of the various events um, that occur in the process of inflammation. Morphological patterns were also explained where you have four of them and um, they are seen in various sites of the body. So see you again in part three uh, of the lecture in which we will cover um, outcomes as well as systemic effects of inflammation. Thank you.